Hello and welcome. I'm Annette Reader from the biblicalnutritionist.com. And today I get the privilege of sharing with you an interview that I did. And this gentleman overcame cancer naturally. And we're going together share with you the eight steps that are necessary for each one of us to heal from other diseases, to overcome other health challenges. And this is just eight steps that we should be doing on a daily basis. Well, whether you have cancer or not, this video is going to be very pertinent to you and your health challenges. And you may have other people in your life that you want to share this with. So please hit the like and the subscribe and hit that bell next to it so you get notified as I continue to post more videos to help you understand God's recipe for excellent health. And remember, it always includes the one ingredient that God loves you. He's an amazing God. He's the only living true God. And he loves you just as much today as he did yesterday and as much as he will tomorrow. You can go to him anytime you want. Now, let's look at this interview with Chris Wark. Well, welcome, Chris. It is my privilege just to have this time to chat with you. I have been following you for a while now, and I'm just, first of all, I'm honored to have this time with you. And second of all, I just want to say, you know, praise the Lord that you're here to do this interview. Uh, so many people at the age of 26, and what most people don't realize is when you have cancer at a young age, the risk of that coming back and returning with a more severe, you know, diagnosis is very common. And yet to see you here this long after your cancer and doing extremely well is exactly what I want people to know. I want people to see this. I want them to see it and hear it and feel it and know that this is so possible no matter what age. So Chris, welcome to our, the biblical nutritionist. Thank you, Annette. It's good to be with you. And uh, you're right. Um, young adult cancer is, is typically more aggressive, uh, or I should say cancer in young adults is more aggressive. Uh, and, uh, often returns after treatment. And, uh, I was diagnosed at 26 years old in 2003. I'm 46 years old today. And, uh, yeah, about to, you know, this December I'll celebrate my 20 year cancer anniversary, which is, uh, amazing to me. I'm, I'm just as surprised as anybody. <laughs> um, but not, not really surprised, but, uh, uh, it doesn't feel like it's been 20 years. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. God's really blessed me. And, uh, you know, when I was first diagnosed, I'm a believer. And so when I was first diagnosed, one of the first verses that came to mind was Romans 8, 28, which says, we know that God works all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And a cancer diagnosis is, is terrible. It's frightening. It's, it's traumatic. Uh, some patients suffer PTSD symptoms just from the diagnosis. I mean, it's that traumatic. Um, someone telling you, but you have a fatal disease, you know, potentially fatal disease. And um, so I, you know, that happened to me obviously in, in 2003. And I was a, a typical cancer patient in many ways uh, because I didn't know anything about the disease and I didn't know anything about the treatments. And so what happens to most patients is they're rushed into treatment before they have time to read and research and think about their life and their situation and pray and seek the Lord and seek counsel from other people. It's just, they're just rushed in. So within days of a diagnosis, they're in surgery or they're starting chemo or they're starting radiation. Sometimes it's the next day. I mean, that's how fast the train, right, is moving. And once you're on the chemo train or on, on the cancer train, uh, it's hard to get off. And uh, so after my diagnosis, they wanted to have me in surgery just a couple of days uh, after. And I happened to postpone it. I asked to postpone it because it was two days before Christmas. And I was like, you know, pretty depressed. <laughs> and I just thought, gosh, can I just at least have a normal Christmas, you know, with my family and at home and stuff and not be in the hospital over Christmas. So we postponed it to December 30th and I went in and they took out a third of my large intestine. And, um, when I woke up, they said, it's worse than we thought you're stage three. They were hoping I would be stage two and stage two, uh, you have surgery and they send you home and that's it. You're done. 
At least that was their protocol back then. Stage three means it's cancer had spread to my lymph nodes. And I was told I would need nine to 12 months of chemotherapy. That's, and I hear what you're saying, because that's exactly what happened in our family story as well, both with my mom and with one of our family members here. It is, it's a rush effect and it's a don't pause, don't think, just rush into it. And for those that are watching, I know many people are, are on that train. We're not saying that that is wrong, but what we want to gain today is what you went through and why you made decisions that you made and how God created our body to heal when we give it what it really needs to heal. And when we're in a cancer situation, we use what we call therapeutic doses. So yes, you can eat an apple a day and get great benefits and just for long-term you know, help. But when you're in this situation that you were in and with our family members were in, you then add in therapeutic doses, which I know you're going to share with us today, like how extreme that can be, but yet why it works. So go ahead and continue with your story. Yeah, I love what you said, and I, I'm, I'm excited to unpack that. So uh, I, there are, you know, there I am in the hospital, bad news. I was, you know, on heavy pain medication, but I still knew like, man, this is not good. A um, couple things happened in the hospital. The first thing that happened uh, <laughs> that got, got the wheels turning was the very first meal that they served me after cutting out a third of my large intestine was a sloppy Joe. <laughs> that just is, I mean, it, it's humorous. You, you have to wonder what nutritionist planned that meal for you. Exactly. And a nutritionist did not plan the meal. I can tell you, <laughs> right. This is the hospital cafeteria. Today's sloppy Joe day. Everybody gets sloppy Joe's it's just like you're in summer camp or the military or prison. This is what they're serving sick people. Granted, it's improved somewhat in 20 years, but hospital food is still generally pretty terrible. Uh, the irony, and it is funny for sure. I mean, the irony is that uh, red meat is a known uh, group two carcinogen. <laughs> it's a known cause of cancer and they're serving it to cancer patients. Uh, so, you know, that got the wheels turning. And then a few days later, when they told me I could go home, I was talking to my surgeon and I happened to ask him, Hey, is there any food I need to avoid? Because again, they took out a third of my large intestine. Everything you eat is going through there, right? Going down the tube. And I, I just wanted to make sure I didn't eat something that was off limits, you know, like hot sauce or something. And his answer was no, just don't lift anything heavier than a beer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what, I mean, right. verbatim. That's what he said. That was his little boilerplate sort of joke that he, I'm sure, told everyone after they had abdominal surgery. And that was it. I mean, that was all the nutritional advice I got. And it, to me, it just, it just was absurd. Like, it doesn't matter what you eat because that was the message that I was getting. It doesn't matter what you eat. In fact, drink beer if you want, right? Drink alcohol if you want. And the tragedy, what I would call medical negligence, is the fact that there's so much published data on cancer survival, on nutrition, on lifestyle interventions, and how they can help reduce your risk of cancer and increase your odds of survival. It's known, and doctors don't even tell their patients. Number one, smoking. It's the number one cause of cancer still. And many cancer patients who smoke are not even told to stop smoking by their doctors. When we know if you stop smoking, your odds of survival go up. <laughs> if you stop smoking, if you continue to smoke, it's to smoke your odds of death go up. Uh, same with alcohol. If you continue to drink alcohol, you're, you have a much uh, worse prognosis. Your odds of survival are much lower if you continue to drink alcohol. And I, there was just a, there. Were, this is breaking information. Actually, there was a survey done, a study that was just published that really blew my mind. They found that over 80% of cancer patients drank alcohol after their diagnosis, continue to drink alcohol. Over 80%, isn't that wild? It is. And uh, something like 30% of them were identified as binge drinkers. And another 40% of them identified as uh, drinking unhealthy levels of alcohol, right? 
So more like alcoholic type consumers, right? Where they're drinking three, four, five plus drinks every day. Uh, and that to me just, just shows that there's been a, a glaring, uh, gl just negligence in the medical community that cancer patients aren't even told, Hey, you know, if you stop drinking your odds of survival go up, <laughs> like if you really want to live and you want to do everything to help yourself survive, here's some th simple things, stop smoking and stop drinking. That's the first step right? And start exercising. These, these three things are, are proven to increase survival. Patients aren't told. Okay. So that's a rabbit trail. But anyway, so here I am, I go home from surgery. I'm recovering. I'm weaning myself off the pain medication. And as I sobered up, I really got to thinking about my life and my future. And I saw myself as a chemo patient and that was a frightening, right? It was frightening to, to imagine myself becoming what I had seen other people become. And, um, and, and I had this increasing internal resistance to do, to chemotherapy, right? Because I just, I didn't know much about it, but I knew it was like really toxic and your hair falls out and it makes you super sick. And, um, I didn't want that to happen to me. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think any cancer patient does. I don't think anyone wants to do chemo, but the cancer industry uses this terminology, you know, like, You've got to fight cancer. It's a battle. It's a war. You're a warrior. You're a survivor. You know what's crazy is uh, the American Cancer Society, what their definition of a cancer survivor is, is anyone who's diagnosed is, a, is immediately a survivor. Same day. As soon as you're diagnosed, you're now called a cancer survivor. But they use this military terminology to convince patients that they have to suffer, right? Because if you believe that you're in a battle and a war and it's a fight and you're a warrior, then all of a sudden this suffering that, well, that makes sense. But the goal isn't to beat it, even though my, my book is called Chris Beat Cancer. Uh, what I've come to realize is the goal is to heal it, <laughs> right? That's the goal. You're sick. You need to heal. Yeah. And I feel like the family members want to be in the battle too. And it's like, they, they want to do what they can. They want to say, I'll encourage you. I will support you. And they pretty much can in, uh, very strongly encourage a family member to go that route. Even when that family member is saying, wait a minute, I want to pause and think about this. But yes. the siblings or the children, whatever they're, they're like, they feel helpless but they know I will encourage you. I will take you there. I will, you know, I will do everything. I will help you make this happen. And so they want to do their part in the battle by being that supportive, you know, relative. Right. Whereas sometimes the patient is actually saying, but what, what if I chose a different route? And so did you ever, well, the patients have this heightened. So a cancer patient has a, a heightened survival instinct, right? You have yeah. a heightened survival instinct and you're, and, uh, Typically, you're surrounded by people who are telling you to do one thing who don't know what they're talking about. They don't know anything about cancer. They don't know anything about the drugs, the treatments, the side effects, the the um, uh, the progression-free survival, the disease-free survival, the the overall survival of these treatments. They don't know anything, right? And they're telling you you have to do it. Oh, you have to do what the doctor says. You have to do chemo. You have to, right? right? Literally, these and people like this. I had people like this in my life. They mean well. They love you, but they, they do. don't know what they're talking about and they're scared and they just think, you know, this must be the best option because this is what everybody does. And, but if you think about it rationally and logically, it's like, yeah, this is what everybody does, but look at the outcome. How many people in your life have done exactly what the doctors told them and they suffered and they died. So I, uh, 
I prayed about it. My wife and I prayed and I just said, God, if there's another way besides chemotherapy, please show me. I don't know what to do, but I trust you and I trust you to supply all of my needs. And uh, I need some help. Like it was a prayer of desperation, but also one of faith, right? I was trusting and believing that God would supply my needs that he'd provide for me, that he He would just show me what to do because I, I was conflicted. You know, I didn't want to do chemo, but I didn't know that there was any other option. Two days later, I got a book sent to me from a friend of my dad's. And this book was about healing cancer and, and chronic disease with raw food written by George Malcolmus. And George had found out he had colon cancer back in the 1970s and had seen people around him go through treatment, suffer and die. Happened to have a friend that told him, hey, you need to go back to the Garden of Eden and eat raw fruits and vegetables. That's what you need to do. If you don't want to do conventional treatment, this is what you should do. And you should probably, you know, get a juicer and start juicing carrots and drink carrot juice every day. And um, so that's what George did. And uh, within a year, his tumor was gone. His body had healed. It wasn't a miracle cure or a magic bullet or a quick fix. It took a year, but his body healed. And I was so encouraged by his story. I was just like, I, it was, I just knew it was an answer to prayer. I prayed, this book showed up. I'm like, this is it. Like I asked for something and here it is, <laughs> you know, like I had no doubt at all. Now people around me had doubts, but I did not. And I was like, I, I was like, I just knew this is what I have to do. And so overnight, I mean, immediately I converted to a raw food diet. I went to the groceries, I went to Whole Foods, loaded up the cart, with fruits and vegetables. I bought a juicer. They used to sell juicers at Whole Foods back then. And um, I was on my way. Like, I'm like, I'm doing this. So there was a lot of pressure, as you just alluded to, from family members to uh, do chemotherapy. And, and they sort of gotten wind that I was thinking about not doing chemo because I had said things to my wife, like, I, I don't know if I want to do it. You know, I, and I was really excited about what I would, this guy's book and what, you know, the raw food diet and, you know, all these light bulbs are going off, right? I was like having all these epiphanies, like, and the big one that no one had told me is that the reason so many of us suffer with chronic diseases, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease is because of our diet and lifestyle choices. Our choices have created many of our diseases over time. And to me, that wasn't, it didn't make me feel bad about my choices. It made me really excited. <laughs> you know, I didn't feel guilty or ashamed. I was empowered to when I realized like, wait a second, if I've been contributing to my disease, maybe I can contribute to my health. Exactly. And so... Unfortunately, what happens in the cancer industry is that cancer patients are victimized and they're told there's nothing you did to contribute to your disease. Uh, it's either, you know, genetic or it's bad luck. And there's nothing that you need to do, right? You don't need to change your diet. No, don't take supplements. No, go, don't get on the internet. No, you don't, don't do any of that. You just make sure you show up for your next appointment, right? We are your only hope. This is yep. the message of the conventional cancer treatment industry. And again, patients are turned into these helpless, powerless victims. And they believe they're a victim. They go home and say, well, my doctor said I don't have to change my diet. My doctor said stress doesn't cause cancer. My doctor said I shouldn't take supplements. My doctor said I shouldn't eat uh, too many fruits because it's too much sugar. Right? This is what, this par what patients end up parroting. Uh, and they want to believe it because it lets them off the hook. Yeah, it does. Right? That's exactly what they're looking for. If you're a victim, you're not responsible. And But what happens is when you become a victim, you abdicate all of your power and your authority to someone else. You're putting all of your faith, hope, and trust in a doctor or team of doctors who you don't even really know. You just met these people. If you ran into them at the grocery store, they wouldn't even know your name because they're seeing 50 patients a day, sometimes more. So the medical system, you know, you're basically just a number. You're a number, you're 
sort of treated and herded like cattle. And um, no one will take better care of you than you if you choose to. And uh, anyone who's listening or watching, you know, if, you, if you've had any family member get seriously sick with a disease like cancer or another chronic disease, you've probably seen how just horrible and ineffective hospitals are in the medical community and it's lousy and it's not the doctor's fault. They're just part of a really lousy, broken system. There's a lot of good doctors. There's some terrible doctors. Make no mistake. There are some really bad doctors, greedy, narcissistic, sociopathic, evil doctors. Okay. There's just as many bad doctors as there are bad people in any other profession. <laughs> like, exactly. don't forget that. And most, most people don't even, don't even cross their mind. They assume all doctors are saints or something. It's just not true. By the way, doctors uh, are not any healthier than the rest of the population. Lots of them are overweight or obese. They smoke cigarettes. They drink too much alcohol. They're on prescription medications, right? So these are not people that you're going to get good health and wellness advice from generally, right? Doesn't mean there, there aren't some very health conscious doctors, sure. But a lot of them aren't. So don't go to them looking for that or, or looking for validation on your health and wellness path that they're going to say, oh, that's a great idea because <laughs> a lot of them won't because they're not healthy themselves. Uh, I, think it's, one of the, I think one of the most important, important requirements that every cancer patient can make is that the doctor they choose to go to, whether it's a someone who's offering natural solutions or conventional is that that doctor allows them to work with a nutritionist or be smart on their own for nutrition. And if that doctor says no, so I've shared many times on this YouTube channel about my mom's, my mom's story of her cancer. She was given five years to live with a rare thymoma. Um, at 19 years, I was still calling my oncologist friend. Hey, Dr. Epstein, what do you think about? And he's, he was retired. He's like, Annette, I'm retired. I said, I know, but what do you think about? And I was running more things across and he says, Annette, I can't believe you're still calling me that you, you, we, I've told you over and over nutrition is not proven to help with cancer. I said, yes, but look what we've done. And he's like, I can't believe what you've done, you know? And it's like, sure enough, they, you know, make sure you're working with a doctor, no matter which Avenue you go down, who's willing to work with you on nutrition. I think what you're saying is so important. And if they're not, we walked out of the office of one doctor who said, no, if you touch a supplement or you change your eating, I refuse to touch you. And I say, good, let's go. Now we know we don't want you. And people have to be willing to do that. They have to be willing to stand up and say, you know what? I know it's best for me and you're not on the list. And they have to be willing to say, what you're trying to say too is doctors aren't gods. And many people elevate them to that level. And that's what you're saying is like, yes. hey, be, be willing to speak up for yourself and to request what's necessary for your personal treatment. So thanks for well, sharing yeah. And that's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing what you just did. Um, uh, because it just further proves this, this important point that there, doctors can be very useful for sure, but, uh, they certainly don't know everything and they're not trained in nutrition at all. And they say things like what you just quoted. There's no evidence that nutrition helps with cancer. That's, that's false. That is patently false. There are so many studies on nutrition and cancer survival. So many and that's just an ignorant doctor. He doesn't, he just not even reading the literature. He wasn't taught it in med school and he hasn't read it since he graduated. <laughs> like, right. and the sad thing is, is that so many doctors, once med school's over, most of their education comes from drug reps. Pharmaceutical reps call on them almost every day and educate them on new drugs. And that's, and then they just see patients all day. And so they, they really stop if they ever were in, an independently minded uh, researcher, well, that pretty much stops because they get so busy seeing patients and prescribing drugs uh, and then learning about the new new drug from the pharmaceutical salesperson. So it's a messed up system for sure. Now I do have a free resource for your audience. It's called 20 questions for your oncologist. And if you go to chrisbeatcancer.com, there's a link to it on every page of my website. It's very easy to find. 
Uh, and this will arm you with the most important questions that you need to ask your oncologist before starting treatment, or if, even if you've already started treatment, because patients are not told the whole story and they go into treatment, they're rushed into treatment out of fear with very little information. But if you ask the right questions, you will get answers that will imp inform you and empower you to make the best decision for you. And like your, your example was a perfect one about, you know, obviously you had a conversation with your doctor and you were bringing up nutrition and things. And he basically said, if you change your diet or take supplements, I won't work with you. Th that was a blessing. Like when a doctor says something like that to you, you need to know, okay, this is not the doctor for me. Right. Right. And there are doctors. Yeah. And you need to be willing to walk out because, you know, people will get three bids from a painter to paint their house. And then they just go with the first doctor that they're referred to. Like that doesn't make sense. Get a second opinion, a third opinion, get five opinions. Keep looking until you find a doctor that will support you, right? And will support your decisions. So anyway, go get that guide, 20 questions for your oncologist. It's very helpful. It's a one hour audio uh, class with a downloadable transcript and downloadable question list. And I mean, the feedback from that has just been phenomenal. It's, it's, I created it probably 10 years ago. So, um, so back to my story. So I, you know, I reluctantly went to go see an oncologist because of, I had all this pressure from family members and guess what? The appoint appointment went badly. We, he treated us badly. He talked down to us. He, like, when I asked him about diet, the raw food diet, he said, I couldn't do it. Uh, at one point he said, look, I'm not telling you this because I need your business which was such a weird, it's like a, you know, a tell, you know, it's like a Freud, Freudian slip almost. Cause I wasn't thinking about the cancer industry or the, the financial side of it at all until he brought that up. And I'm like, Oh, wait a second. This is a business, isn't it? Like these people are not volunteers, <laughs> right? Like this is a multi-million dollar clinic, right? And then I, I learned much later, you know, the average cancer patient is worth $300,000 in revenue. And, and sometimes it's upwards of a million dollars in revenue. That's and true. so you become like an ATM, right? All from the doctor's visits, the hospital visits, the surgery, the chemo, the radiation, the scans, breast reconstruction, physical therapy, nipple tattoos. Like, I mean, it's a massive money-making industry. And the problem is they do all this stuff to you. And then uh, in many cases, the person doesn't get well. They're just treated until the very last breath. And cancer patients have high rates of bankruptcy because the medical industry sucks all of the money, right? Extra extracts as much money as possible from them. Not only their money, but extracts money from all their, their family and their friends and anybody they can convince to donate, to raise money, to help them with treatments. It's, it's horrific. It was what we call cancer metastasizing to your wallet. That's a good point. So I, uh, I left that oncology appointment uh, very discouraged because we were treated so badly and, and just really feeling hopeless. And that's what a lot of patients experience uh, because the cancer clinics are, are fear factories and they manipulate people into, into saying yes to treatment out of fear. And you know, when you're in a state of fear or worry or anxiety or stress, your brain chemistry changes and you can't make a rational, logical, reasonable decision when you're in that state. Cause you're not using the front of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, which is where you think logically, <laughs> like the back, you're using the back of your brain, like your limbic brain, which is your survival, like reptilian brain they call it. And that's, that part of your brain is rash, impulsive, irrational, uh, and easy to manipulate and coerce. And that's what we saw in 2020, right? During the pandemic, people were so indoctrinated with fear. They became very, very easy to coerce and they were coerced. And I even made a, a comment on social media back in the thick of it saying, well, now you know how the cancer, how cancer patients feel. Now the world knows how cancer patients feel to be struggling with fear every single day. Cancer patients don't need to be reminded how scary cancer is. Every day 
they're struggling with the fear. When you wake up, it's the first thing you think about when you wake up. It's the last thing you think about when you go to bed. And that you have these brief moments of respite during the day where you forget that you have cancer and it's, it's glorious, right? When you're working or you're having a great conversation with someone or playing with your kids or distracted, right? At the gym, anything like it's great. But then you remember you have cancer and then here comes a big wave of fear, you know, cold sweat and fear and the not in the pit of your stomach. And it's really tough. Um, but what I learned to do in those moments was I learned to give my fear to God and just to say, I I trust you. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm just giving you my fear. I'm laying it at the feet of Jesus. I'm just going to lay it down. I'm not going to let this fear and anxiety and worry about tomorrow steal my joy today. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. That's what he said. He said, don't worry about tomorrow unless, no, there's no unless he just said, don't worry about tomorrow. (laughs) That's right. I think that's right. a really good point too, for everyone to really just to pause is, and, and I, you pointed it out too, when you get the diagnosis, don't rush into. So that's that, okay, don't worry about tomorrow. And then every day you are, it comes to mind because it keeps coming to mind and coming to mind because it's almost like it's, it's as common as the sky. It's just there in front of you. But yet what you're saying is just say, just trust the Lord in your decision and follow through with that and not be caught up in anxiety. Don't be, you know, timid and just scripture's clear about that yeah. and how we are to trust him. So I appreciate and you, you the point. And, and the thing, the, the thing about that's so great about God is that you don't just have to blindly trust him. Like when you put your faith out there and you ask for help, help's coming. Exactly. You no, know, it's coming. Things are going to happen. People, information, circumstance, Things are going to happen and you need to be aware, like you need to have your antenna up, right? And and not just shrug things off like, oh, it's just a coincidence or something. Like, no, wait a second. Like this book showed up or this person came into my life or, you know, and so I started to see all of these beautiful, what I call mini miracles, <laughs> you know, happening along the way. Because for me, the cancer journey was very lonely. I didn't really have any support. You know, most of my close family around me just didn't understand. And my friends didn't understand. They didn't know how to help me or support me. And, you know, and I, I, I made a decision to not do chemotherapy, right? I decided I'm not doing it maybe later, but what I wanted to do and what I was excited about and driven to do was to build my body up. I wanted to build myself up. I didn't want to tear my body down. I wanted to do everything in my power to flood my body with nutrition, to take care of myself in a way that I never had before and change my whole life. I do everything that I could to orient my life toward health and healing. And that really just means changing your daily routine, right? It's like, you don't have to, you can plan for the future and you certainly should plan for tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow, but Health happens one day at a time. Disease happens one day at a time. And so it's really just like, what is my daily routine and how can I optimize it to promote health? So <clears throat> I I just systematically started rearranging my life and focusing on how to, to overdose on nutrition, which was a, an idea that was humorous to me, you know, sort exactly. of, yeah. Uh, and, but I just thought, you know, if I'm not doing chemo, I, I better overdose on nutrition, right? I, I, I better do that. I should do that. And so I found a naturopathic doctor and through him, I found an integrative oncologist. And the great thing is like, when you, when you find one person in sort of the underground holistic health space, like it opens up the whole world to you because they know people, right? So all of a sudden I just started finding more people, you know, because the, the, the holistic doctors, they're not advertising typically, right? You know, That's right. it's like, they're not in the major hospitals. They're in these tiny little, you know, tiny little two or three room offices, you know, and maybe in a bad part of town. <laughs> my, my integrative oncologist was, was in a bad part of town. Uh, and, um, but was an incredible ally and supported me. And it was, I'm just, so thankful for him. He's passed away now because he was in his seventies when I met him, but he was doing IV vitamin C and, and other type 
uh, of he was pursuing, you know, natural non-toxic therapies uh, for cancer after spending his entire career as a conventional oncologist. In his 70s, he started practicing integrative oncology. <laughs> that was smart of him. And I agree with that. I agree with everything he was doing. So we've done that as well with uh, with my mom. We did that, especially the vitamin C IVs. And yeah, people think, oh, well, that's just, I don't know. You probably have a good word for what they think. It's like, they think, oh, well, that's, how do you know that's going to work? Well, how do you know chemo is going to work? You don't, unless you've done different studies on that chemo with your cells specifically to know if it would even work. But you you don't know if that chemo is going to work. You're just right. a statistic, and those statistics aren't good for everyone. <laughs> there is a there, well. Sp speaking of the the statistic, every cancer patient should know, every human should know, even before you get cancer, is that the cancer industry has only reduced the death rate from cancer in the United States by about five percent in almost seventy years. So since the advent of chemotherapy, basically in the fifties, the death rate of cancer has come down 5%. They've made great progress with childhood leukemia, testicular cancer, pretty good with lymphomas and like CLL adult leukemia, but the solid tumor cancers have almost zero progress in, in reducing the death rate. Lung cancers come down because a lot of people have quit smoking. Yeah. Not because the drugs are great right. it's because smoking has, is fallen out of fashion. You know, Thanks. people are aware now how horrible and harmful it is. And so that's good. That's human behavior has dropped that cancer rate more than any, any medical treatment, but colon cancer, liver cancer, brain cancer, ovarian, cervical, pancreatic, multiple myeloma, like osteosarcoma. There, there's a long list of cancers that they've made almost no progress in terms of lowering the death rate. And so knowing that should give you pause, right? It should, it should give you a healthy dose of skepticism toward this industry that's constantly promoting this false hope that patients think, you know, their, their likelihood of being cured is high when it actually is in many cases, very low. And doctors have, has, have even admitted in studies that they're Many doctors are uncomfortable telling their patients that they can't cure them. Right. Because it's an awkward conversation. So they avoid telling them that, which leads the patient on to believe that a cure is possible. And uh, I talk about this in my, my first book, Chris Beat Cancer. There's, there's four chapters in there that are expose chapters on the cancer industry, medical industry, pharmaceutical industry, and how, how much published science and research is out there showing how ineffective the treatments are. Like it's not, it's not conspiracy theory. It's not, it's not speculation. Like this is their own data showing how ineffective treatments are and how money drives that industry. At the end of the day, all the money trickles up to the pharmaceutical companies. And so mm -hmm. a patient, like I said earlier, I mean, it's a patient is a customer that they try to extract as much money from as possible. All right. Well, let's go to your journey though. Let's give me a, a quick synopsis. How did, how did you deal with it? So you said nothing, you weren't going to follow conventional after surgery. So let's bring that to like, what does that look like? And then how are you relating that to today? And then also what can someone watching take from this? So yeah. let's do those three steps. Well, first it's important to, to, to give you another statistic, which is that 80% uh, of premature death comes from smoking, poor diet, and lack of exercise. 80% of premature death. That's huge, right? That means that most of your choices determine whether you live a long life or not. It's mostly yeah. up to you. And in terms of cancer, there's debate about this, but uh, some researchers are of the opinion that up 90% of cancers are caused by diet, lifestyle, and environment. I agree with that. And only a small percent are truly genetic and nothing you do could possibly influence them, maybe. But there's a whole field of, of genetics called epigenetics, which is the study of gene expression. And what that what they've researchers have learned is that, oh, wait a second, 
even though you have a um, a genetic proclivity for maybe a certain type of cancer or a, a neurodegenerative disease, your diet and lifestyle can turn those genes off or accelerate those genes, right? Accelerate okay. the expression of those genes. So that still brings it back to your, your personal choices. So what I did fall, falls right in line with this research, which is first is I changed my diet. And I, I adopted a diet that was all raw fruits and vegetables, all organic. And I drank uh, 64 ounces of vegetable juice every single day, mostly carrot juice in the beginning. And then I started blending in more stuff like beets and celery and ginger root. I ate uh, giant salads, giant salads. And I don't mean like a bowl full of iceberg lettuce. I mean, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, onions, mushrooms, peppers, sprouts, broccoli sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, mung bean sprouts, garbanzo bean sprouts, uh, sauerkraut, which is fermented cabbage, uh, olive oil and apple cider vinegar as a dressing, which apple cider vinegar is another fermented food. Uh, very important for uh, to populate your gut with good bacteria. And, um, and then I would top it off with uh, avocado and uh, cancer fighting spices, turmeric, oregano, garlic, cayenne pepper. Parsley is another really amazing anti-cancer herb, you know, yeah. and so that, that became my staple anti-cancer meal. It's actually on the cover of my, of our, our cookbook, which is called beat cancer kitchen. The, the giant salad, there's a beautiful picture of it. And uh, and so I realized I wanna eat every vegetable every day, <laughs> right? <laughs> and of course that's not possible, but the giant salad's pretty close. And and I realized, and it was delicious too. Once I got all those veggies in there and I and I got my all my spices and the oil, the oil and vinegar and the sauerkraut and made this, this bed, uh, sort of, salad concoction. It was so tasty that I was like, man, this is really good. I could eat this every day. This is no problem. I can do this. And then I was like, well, wait a second. I could, maybe I should eat it twice a day because what's a more potent anti-cancer meal? I don't know. I can't conceive of one. So I should probably eat this twice a day, every day. And so that's what I did every single day, twice a day. And if you take the two giant salads, plus the fresh juices uh, throughout the day, and then so I would also eat fresh fruit if I wanted a snack, like an apple or a grapefruit or whatever, and uh, or make fruit smoothies, like put some frozen organic berries in the blender, blueberry, blackberry, raspberry, strawberry, uh, a little bit of water, a banana, blend it up. It's delicious. And berries are the most potent anti-cancer fruits. The salad vegetables, the cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, Brussels sprouts and bok choy, wasabi, mustard, the cruciferous vegetables are the most potent anti-cancer vegetables, second only to garlic, onions, and leeks. So I learned this later, but there's incredible documented research, so many studies on the anti-cancer compounds in those foods. So I was eating the most anti-cancer meal possible <laughs> every exactly single right. day. Yep. And um, that became my nutritional routine. And then, uh, of course, I realized exercise is important and I got a rebounder, was bouncing on the rebounder every day to move my lymphatic system. I was doing some running, just nothing super hard, just like running a mile, you know, that's like seven, eight, nine, 10 minutes, uh, just moving my body, going to the gym a little bit for some uh, lightweight training. But I just realized like, I need to exercise too. I, this is important. Now we know, I didn't even know back then, but now we know how incredible exercise is and how it, it increases your odds of survival because exercise switches off genes that promote cancer and activates anti-cancer genes in your body. And not only that, it improves your circulation. It oxygenates your tissues. It increases detoxification by moving your lymphatic system and through sweating. And of course, if you do it outside, you're getting fresh air and sunshine. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it cannot be under, uh, I mean, it's, it is incredibly underrated, underestimated the benefits of exercise. Most people just exercise because they want to look good on the outside. 
but the benefits you get internally are even better. So, so I was doing that again, this is just a, my daily routine. I just re realized that the most important thing I could spend my money on was taking care of myself was food. Primarily it was the food and I stopped spending money on any, on everything else. <laughs> right. And, uh, like cigarettes and alcohol and drugs was not a problem for me. I wasn't doing any of that stuff. Uh, I mean, I would maybe drink occasionally, but it was just, it wasn't enough for me to, to, um, have any difficulty stopping. And, uh, and so I just became very focused on, uh, optimizing my health. And of course we cleaned out our house and replaced all of our toxic body care products and personal care products with clean, non-toxic brands and organic brands, and just systematically created a much healthier lifestyle. And then working with the naturopath, of course, he had me taking lots of different supplements, you know, herbs and different things. And, you know, who knows if any of them helped? I did IV vitamin C. Who knows if it helped? But I had a, a philosophy, which was um, if there is a potential benefit and no risk of harm, I'll do it. Right? Simple. Potential benefit, no risk of harm, I'll do it. What, whatever therapy it is or supplement it is or what or herb or tea or whatever, sure, no risk of harm. I'll try to try to work it in. Right. And of course, the other, the other uh you know, criteria is if I can get access to it and afford it. That's true. <laughs> so uh there were, you know, there was a place in town that was doing hyperbaric uh oxygen chambers. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of expensive and I, I always wanted to do it, but I was like, oh man, it's it's expensive. And I never did because it really was just pushing my my budget, uh, my budgetary constraints. So um, I created this simple daily routine and just repeated it every day. And I had blood work drawn every month. Uh, I had CT scans every six months for several years. And then, you know, before I knew it, it had been two years and it was just all, all clear. And then I, you know, just kept living my life. And then I hit five years, all clear. And then around six and a half years, you know, I didn't want to talk about cancer. I didn't want to think about it. I was, I had pretty much moved on from it, but I started to get this nagging feeling and maybe it was the Holy spirit, you know, but, uh, that I needed to, to share my story. And I knew there were people out there that needed encouragement, right? I knew there were cancer patients who were desperate, who were depressed, discouraged, hopeless, that needed, you know, what I had to offer. Exactly. Um, as just just encouragement, it, just that alone, you know. But I felt I felt like I had a lot more to offer than that, and um, so I started ChrisBeatCancer.com. That was 2010. And, uh, I started just by writing some articles about what I did and about juicing and raw foods. And I started making videos talking about that stuff. And then I, then people started to come out of the woodwork and I got messages from other cancer survivors who were, had healed with a holistic approach. And the very first person that reached out was a, a woman named Courtney Campbell, and she had healed, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma doing basically the same things I had done. And she had no treatment. And uh, so I was like, wow, hey, can I interview you and, and share it with my audience? And she was like, okay. So I interviewed her and shared her story. And, and by the way, now that was 13 years ago. She now has five kids, <laughs> a beautiful yeah, family. The cancer never came back. Yeah. And she's a dear friend. Um, but I realized, wow, this is so much bigger than me, right? This, mm -hmm. this is so much bigger than my cancer story. There are, there's, there are how many people out there? I don't know, but I know there's people out there that have healed. And I've interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of people in the last 13 years who've healed all types and stages of cancer and, you know, stage four, right? Terminal people who've healed with no conventional treatment, people who've healed after conventional treatment failed. And they were sent home to die. And that's the power. I mean, that that really demonstrates the power that the body has to, to heal itself if given the proper nutrients and care, right? That's the key, right? I have a, I have a funny story about that, though. I was on a bike ride in Florida, I was biking the whole state of Florida in one week. 
from the wow. border all the way down to the Keys. And so I would meet people along the trail and I met this, this guy and, and this lady, they were walking together. And so I stopped and chatted with them and he says, Oh, this, and he says, he told me his name, which I don't remember his name exactly, but he says, and this is my hospice nurse. And I said, I, I said, say that again. He says, yeah, this is my hospice nurse. We've been married now for four years. <laughs> he was in a hospice. He was the patient. In a, and you know, if you know anything about hospice, you, you can only go in hospice if you have less than two years to live because they don't want you in there. So he just determined in his mind, like, I'm not giving into this. And he fell in love with his nurse. And then he just, he worked, he did everything he could to heal from the cancer. And <laughs> it's been four years and he, he loves introducing his what his new wife is. Yeah, this is my, my wife. She was my hospice nurse. That's awesome. I love that so much. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've had the incredible privilege and blessing of, of meeting and interviewing so many people like that with these remarkable healing stories. And to me, you know, on one hand, you could say, wow, it's miraculous, but it's not, you know, I mean, the body is miraculous in its ability it to heal, but healing itself is normal. That's, it that's is. the way we're designed. <laughs> And so, but we've been so conditioned by the medical industry to believe that if you have any chronic disease, you, you can't heal it, that the, right. your only option is drugs. And I'm not just talking about cancer, right? It's heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, type two diabetes, uh, you know, autoimmune disease, like, no, there's no cure. You can't get well. Here's some right. drugs so that you can get out of bed. And you can continue in what I call vertical illness, right? You're not horizontal. You can get out of bed. You can get through the day, but you're not well. And it's, it's tragic. It's, it's infuriating to me that the medical industry is so corrupt that any, any information or research or studies on nutrition and lifestyle interventions to help people actually heal are just ignored. And what happens is like these studies get done at the university level, typically, uh, on, on the anti, on the anti-cancer nutritive properties and, and herbs and spices and fruits and vegetables or whatever. So more studies than you could ever read on, on this topic, but they're published, they're peer reviewed, they're, they, they're put out there into the public domain and that's it. Like they don't go anywhere. They don't go into the medical textbooks. Typically the drug companies don't care because, you know, they can't ma make any money off of apples or grapefruit or blueberries or green tea right. or broccoli or garlic. They, you know, they're yeah. like, what are we going to do with garlic? Nothing like, you know, so it just, the wonderful thing that living in the information age is that if you're looking for it, you can find this information, right? Thank you, Google. <laughs> Thank you, PubMed. Like it's out there. But right. you're not going to get it from your doctor or the hospital or the cancer clinic. And um, and the doctors don't even know it exists because they didn't learn it in med school. So we, we you have to take your power back, right? You have to decide, I'm not going to be a victim of disease. I'm going to I'm going to be victorious. And if you just choose to be victorious, then that means taking full responsibility for your life, for your health, for your situation, and deciding you're going to do everything in your power to help yourself get well. That's what I did. I call it the beat cancer mindset. Everybody I know who's healed against the odds. We had the same mindset, same That's mindset. Right. And it starts with the belief that healing is possible. I mean, that's it. Like that is the spark. Like you have to believe that healing is possible. And if you believe it's possible, then all of a sudden you start to think differently and you start to look for solutions, right? Instead of just accepting that you have a unsolvable problem. Right. So that's and step one is the, is your belief, your belief that healing is possible. Right. And so everything that I do, my, my mission as a cancer survivor and a patient advocate and a hope dealer <laughs> is to inspire that belief that healing is possible. That's why I interview so many cancer survivors and doctors and experts and researchers, because I want my audience to, to, come to believe and know that healing is possible because that's the fuel that they need to keep going every day, right? To help themselves, to stay on the, the healthy path. And because there's a lot of temptations out there, <laughs> there are, right? There are, a lot yeah. of temptations. It's hard. Like it's hard to stay on the path. And so it helps me too. It helps me stay on my own path. It keeps me accountable. 
Um, so the big takeaways, okay. Again, nutrition's huge, fruits and vegetables, even if it's not all raw, a plant-based diet is the optimal diet for health. It doesn't have to be 100% vegan, but if you look around the world at the healthiest, longest living populations, they're eating predominantly plant food and very little animal food. It's right. only about 5% of their diet. So what does that look like? 5% of your diet would be eating a serving of animal protein a few times a week, max. Okay. Max. Um, like, you know, a piece of chicken or whatever, twice a week or a piece of fish a few times a week. Like, right. And we don't, we can't even say for sure if that's a, if that's a healthy level or it's just not enough to be harmful. But what we know is this is common among the longest living people. So predominantly plant food, raw and cooked. That's big piece of advice. Number one, number two, exercising six days a week. Even if it's just walking 20 minutes a day, that's fantastic, right? That's great. It's really good. It's way better for you than you realize. But running, cycling, jogging, jujitsu, like, you know, CrossFit, all exercise is wonderful. So I highly encourage you just, you just have to find something you enjoy or several different types of exercise that you enjoy and block them off in your calendar, in your phone, <laughs> right? This is exercise time and it's non-negotiable. Doesn't matter what time of day you do it. It just needs to happen. Although it is better to like not do it right before bed. <laughs> That's right. the only caveat. Yeah. Early evening's fine. Anytime during the day up to early evening, but don't do it right before bed because it'll uh, affect your sleep. Uh, and um, breaking your bad habits, right? So stop the the alcohol and the tobacco and vaping and, and dip and, you know, whatever, because those are lifestyle habits that cause disease. So that's diet and lifestyle right there. Uh, pharmaceuticals, again, that's part of the lifestyle thing. There's a lot of pharmaceutical drugs that increase your risk of cancer. There are millions of Americans taking pharmaceuticals that are increasing their risk of cancer because so many drugs do. And they even tell you in the commercials, right? There's so many drug commercials that at the end, it's like, may increase the risk of certain types of cancer, right? We've all heard it. And so uh, working with your doctor and when you change your diet and start exercising, guess what? Good things happen in your body and over time, your health should improve significantly and you can work with your doctor to get off of hopefully your high blood pressure medication, your cholesterol medications, your arthritis medications, pain medications, mood medications, things like that. So it's incredible what diet and exercise will do for you if you are just consistent. Fruits and vegetables, move your body. And then the third factor environment is, is a little tricky, but we know there's a ton of environmental pollution, right? a lot of environmental pollution. We've got air pollution problems in, in major cities. We've got water pollution problems in a lot of municipal areas. And even in the, you know, out in the country because of uh, excessive pesticide spraying, it gets into the groundwater. So simple things like getting a good reverse osmosis or a Berkey or a distiller, a good water filter. That's a, everybody should filter your water. Um, Getting an air filter for your home or your bedroom, uh, especially your bedroom. If you can only afford one air filter, put it in your bedroom because you're in there 12 hours you know, every day, every night. Um, and then really looking around and thinking about, am I living in a toxic area? Like, am I working in a toxic facility? Because over time, exposure to, to smoke and dust and fumes, it's going to degrade your health. And, uh, and so just start as you start to become aware of your surroundings, like, am I living in an area that is promoting, possibly increasing my risk of cancer? And then, you know, kind of taking steps to maybe relocate, maybe change jobs, maybe move to a, to a new house, things like that. Those take time, right? But changing your diet and exercise, you can start today. And that you're already starting to protect yourself by doing that, which is the cool thing about fruits and vegetables. There's all these compounds that help protect you from environmental pollution, <laughs> right? So uh, hopefully that, you know, people listening aren't just freaking out like, oh no, right? You're, what you put in your mouth really can be incredibly protective. And so start pumping in the fruits and vegetables. 
Um, and the last thing that's so important, the big, uh, big takeaway here, big takeaway, and we haven't even touched on it at all is stress because stress, stress, let me define it in a simple way. Stress, stress is negative thoughts and negative emotions. Okay. Negative thoughts, negative emotions produce stress. And they could be rooted in the past, like anger and bitterness, unforgiveness. They could be rooted in the future, which would be fear, worry, and anxiety. Or they could be what I call just bad habits in the present, like jealousy, envy, uh, being critical and judgmental, uh, insecurities, uh, beating yourself up, negative self-talk, that kind of thing. And so becoming aware of, of your thoughts taking every thought captive, which is a biblical concept, right? Being aware of what am I thinking? How am I thinking? And catching yourself in the middle of those like critical judgmental moments or envy or, or whatever, and being like, you know what? I'm, I'm actually being envious right now. And I, let me stop and count my blessings because my life's pretty good too. I've got a wife who loves me. I have two beautiful children. I have a home, a bed to sleep in. I have hot water. <laughs> I have air conditioning, like I'm rich <laughs> compared to most of the world. You know, just having those things, having access to food, like, you know, why am I comparing myself to someone who, who I perceive as having more than me? I should be comparing myself to those who have less, right? That's how you, that's how you practice gratitude is you compare yourself to those who are less fortunate and you realize, oh, wow, like I'm really blessed. And, um, and so I developed you know, this, these habits, good habits of catching myself thinking poorly and negatively and interrupting those thoughts and just choosing to think differently. And the biggest of all is forgiveness because anger and bitterness will just rot you from the inside out. Anger and bitterness, bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping it hurts someone else. That's what bitterness is. That's what unforgiveness does to you over time. It will wreck your health. It will make you more unhappy, miserable, depressed, uh, cranky. <laughs> it just it will just turn you into just a nasty, old, unhappy, sick person. And so I I as I started to learn more about the connection between emotions, your emotional health, and your physical health. I realized, you know what? I don't want to leave any stone unturned here. So like, I'm going to forgive every person who's ever hurt me. Every single one until there's no one left. And I set about doing that, right? Just, just, I just set time, sit down in a prayerful, meditative state, you know, and just think through my life and just say, okay, like, who do I need to forgive? Who's hurt me? And I would, you know, try to just search the memory banks, right? Back to elementary school, <laughs> junior high, high school. Yeah, you know, you just start thinking through all the people that have come and gone in your life. And some of them hurt you. And uh, and one by one, by name, I would just say, God, okay, you know what they did? They hurt me. Uh, and I, I don't want to forgive them. I'm still angry, you know, but I'm choosing to forgive them. I'm choosing to do it. Not because I feel like it, because I don't. Choosing to forgive them and I'm letting it go and I'm giving it to you. They're all yours, right? You can deal with them. I'm not going to carry this weight anymore. I'm not going to carry this anger and bitterness and resentment and toxic negative emotion anymore. Like, I'm letting it go. And I'm asking you to bless them. I'm asking you to bless this person who hurt me. Jesus said, love your enemies and, for, and pray for those who persecute you. Like Jesus Christ gives good advice. And so I'm just going to try to be like Jesus, try to follow Jesus, and I'm going to forgive my enemies. I'm going to love my enemies, and I'm going to pray for them and ask you to bless them. And I hope you don't, <laughs> right? Right? I hope you don't bless them, but I'm asking anyway, because I know it's, it's the right thing to do. Like for me, I need to do it. And you know, when you, when you forgive the people who've hurt you and you pray for them and ask God to bless them, you know what happens? He heals your heart. That's when God heals your heart because when people hurt you, they hurt your heart, right? They break your heart. 
they damage your heart. They stomp on it. They beat it up. They bruise it, you know, and if, over time, if that happens enough, you, you end up with a hard heart, right? It's like scar tissue around your heart and uh, forgiveness just breaks it open, you know, and it's like, you just let God in and he heals your heart when you do that. Jesus talked about forgiveness a lot. One of the last things he said, dying, suffering on the cross was father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I mean, can you imagine like he, he made the decision to forgive. He definitely didn't feel like it. He definitely didn't feel like it, but he made the decision to forgive his enemies while he was dying on the cross. And so that is such a powerful revelation. It's like, I've got no excuse, <laughs> right? No excuse. No one's nailed me to a cross. Nobody's hurt me like that. And so, so this is something that uh, I've seen free people from pain like nothing else is forgiveness. And it's the most powerful thing you can do for yourself for yourself. You don't have to see that person ever again. This is between you and God. Um, and uh, but it, it's also good to ask for forgiveness, you know, for people you've hurt to make amends. It's you want to ask God to forgive you for your your failures and your flaws and your your sin, right? You want to get right with God too. So forgiveness works in multiple ways. Uh, and and I want to encourage you to like explore all of the ways <laughs> that forgiveness can help you. And it's free. That's the best part. It costs you nothing. You just have to decide to do it. And so I've become a person now that I'm, I'm, I've exercised my forgiveness, my forgiveness muscle a lot. And now I'm a person who's quick to forgive. You know, people have said all kinds of mean things to me on the internet. <laughs> And I just, I just forgive them. You know, I just say, God, that was, wow. That was mean. That, that kind of stings, you know, that hurts. That was a personal attack for sure. Uh, this person means to do me harm, but I forgive them and I'm letting them go and they're all yours. And I'm asking you to bless them. And I move on. That is, that is so true. We did an interview in our treasures of healthy living DVD series. And in the week of forgiveness, we did an entire week on forgiveness. Wow. And we had Sue Becker from Bread Beckers come in and give her testimony. And she teaches colon health. She teaches how to have a healthy diet. She teaches how to mill your own grain. I mean, she has a beautiful story. And then for her to come down with colon cancer, we were all just befuddled. We were all like, this can't happen. This is, but this is what you teach. You teach everything that's against this. But it came down to, in her testimony, it was an unforgiveness issue. Mm. And when someone confronted her, like, what about this one situation? She's like, well, it can't be that. <laughs> she, was, she was pretty quick, like, well, surely that's not it. And then she finally had to evaluate her own heart. Like, okay, maybe I responded a little too quickly. And maybe that's evidence that I had unforgiveness in my heart. And she, that truly was the root of her cancer. And, you know, we can do so much to eat healthy. We can do so much to exercise, but if we're not willing to forgive, I share this story often about my mom. She was diagnosed with the five year, as I've already shared. She lived 19 years, but why, why was it only 19? She should still be alive today. She had an unforgiveness that she wasn't willing to let go of. Hmm. And so everyone has to make that decision for themselves. Are you really willing to take this to the grave? Are you willing for this to be what takes you to the grave sooner than you should be? And forgiveness is the root of, I believe, more so than what we eat in our exercise. And it's no excuse not to eat healthy or to exercise, but we can truly see the root of unforgiveness and yeah. the harm that it causes to us and the people around us. So you really nailed it with that one. Thank you. And you know, it all works together, right? It all works together. The it diet does. and the exercise, they make it, it just gets you on the healthy path, right? It gets the, it gets, it gives you this momentum. It gets the ball rolling. It gets you feeling better and, and you can do it immediately. And then as you, as you get going, then you start work sorting through all the hard stuff, right? Yep. Your attitude, your emotions, your behavior, your thought life, forgiveness, like that stuff does take time to work through. And, um, 
I, my, my challenge is like, you know, is it really worth dying over? Is right. your anger toward, you know, fill in the blank person? Is it really worth dying over? My, my answer is it's not, I really don't think it is <laughs> to whoever's listening. It's not like, forgive them. You know, God says, vengeance is mine right? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and do not repay evil for evil. And so if it helps at all, you can have confidence that people who did you wrong are going to get what's coming to them, right? They, they're going to get what they deserve, whether you see it or not, right? whether you know about it or not, like you can, you can be confident if that helps you forgive a little bit, <laughs> you know, like we, you reap what you sow and people that sow harm and evil, they reap evil in their own lives and harm and, and yeah. chaos and calamity in their own lives. And so, but just give it to, give it to God, let him deal with it because guess what? None of us are perfect. We all need forgiveness. We all need it. And Jesus said, if you don't forgive on heaven in, I'm sorry, <laughs> That was that was a horribly butchered quote. Jesus said, "If you don't <laughs> forgive on earth, your heavenly Father won't forgive you." Right. That's scary. Let's, you know, let that scare you into forgiving people if that's what it takes. <laughs> All right. Well, Chris, I really appreciate you spending this time with us, and I know there has been many takeaways from what you have shared. But what I believe is the most is is the hope. If you are some people live in fear of getting cancer. Some people live in fear of having cancer and the fear is not in God's word. We are to fear the Lord, but that is to be in awe of him and what he's yeah. going to do in and through you, your body, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. And yet you also, we ended with the forgiveness factor, which is the most important part of this whole journey is learning to forgive and learning to pray for things to to work out for those other people. So we have to see our, I always tell people it's like, it's not what they did to you. It usually means something's going on in their life that caused them to, to be mean. And typically it has nothing to do with us. It's usually something that we can't see or feel. We may have gotten the hit from it, <laughs> but see it as God sees is like, and just don't say to God, God, I know you're taking care of that person and you're working in that situation. If And I'm praying for that to work out for their good. That's when we know we can truly forgive is when we can pray yeah. for something good to come from that other person or to that other person. But Chris, you have an amazing story and it's a story of hope. It's a story of how everyone can just take little bits of what you've shared or, or get your books and get gather even more information or go to your website and get more information. We'll have all of that on the screen. And so you offer hope and that's what people need because of the escalating diagnosis of cancer that's happening in today's world. It's become more than just a plague. It is now, um, it's just a, a tidal wave that is sweeping over across our nation and people needed to hear this message. And I thank you for sharing it with us. Do you, do you have any uh, final words that you wanna share? Well, thank you so much for having me on. I, I really appreciate being able to share my story with your audience and um and uh hopefully they've, you know, I've given them more hope and encouragement and inspiration. That's what I'm here to do. And uh and just it's just so important that you know there's you're not a victim of disease, that your choices okay. really do affect your life and your future, that God created this cause and effect world. And he gave us free will and our choices have consequences. And sometimes they're really good consequences and sometimes they're bad, right? Our choices really do create our life and our future. And, uh, and so if you step back and realize you're, if anything, in many cases, you're a victim of your own choices, then that empowers you to change, right? To make exactly. different choices, to live your life each day differently. Right. And, um, that's these, these are the, the lessons that cancer taught me, right? This is what cancer taught me. I didn't know it before cancer. <laughs> I, I didn't understand any of these things. And, uh, 
But if you, if you want to get well, there's definitely a path. There's a healthy path. There's a path to healing that many, many people have taken before you. And it's not the conventional path, right? It's, it's kind of like hacking your way through the jungle a little bit, right? It can feel a little bit lonely because the people around you typically don't understand why, you know, you are only eating fruits and vegetables, <laughs> for example, <That's laughs> you know, or why you're not drinking alcohol anymore or why you're, you know, working to get off pills or you're not smoking uh, weed or whatever. So, but it's okay. Like, that's the beautiful thing about faith. Like when you step out in faith, when you step out of the boat, like your heavenly father is there to support you and lead you in the path of healing. Like the Bible says, Proverbs says, a man makes plans, but the Lord directs his steps, you know? And so as you start to make plans to take care of yourself, God's going to direct your steps, right? You just have to have that tiny little mustard seed of faith, like the tiniest little bit of faith, right? That he's going to help you and provide for you. Like you have that little bit of faith and you take a little bit of action and watch what happens. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and being part of the Biblical Nutritionist family and many blessings to you and your adventures. And I know everyone's going to check out your website and find all of your resources. So thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you, Annette. It was my pleasure.